TorahCafe.com. Um, some of the faces here are uh, familiar from visits in uh, Hebron. Um, I'm sure it's a city that's, that's everybody heard of. Well, some people visited, some people connected more or less, but it's definitely a place that always causes, you know, I, I try to uh, keep a straight face when people ask me, both me and my wife, they ask us, where are you from? I'm going to say in a very casual way, like you would say Colorado or uh, New York or Petah Tikva in Shalim, except Rome. And there's always a reaction. You know, it's usually it's usually a very you know, too extreme. It's somebody that's talking to that's on the more traditional or right wing side of the map. Politically, re religiously, it's a hey, Colorado, keep up the fight. As if that's what they're doing there every day, just taking bullets and fighting. And uh, if that's on the other side, it would be a reaction like, you know, it's one of the Meshuganas that we hear about in the world. And uh, unfortunately, you know, if you would ask a Yid, a Jew 200 years ago, he'd stop him in the street in Morocco or in, or in, uh, or in Ukraine, in Russia, anywhere, and just say the word Hebron, they think about Avram <coughs> they think about Marat about the history, about the connection. Uh, in the past 40, 50 years, you say the word Hebron, even though it comes from the Hebrew word Hibu, which means to connect connections, usually it's associated with words that are opposite of connection, conflict and uh, terror and uh, extremism, politics, and so on and so forth. So we, we're, we're in Hebron already for um, uh, 13 years, Baruch Hashem, is the Rebbe's uh, Shmukim, is the Chabad uh, Embassy in downtown Hebron. I just, I, I have to share this with you. We, we had part of our job, a, a, a large part of our job is welcoming uh, tourists, welcoming groups, making sure that when they come, they have a connecting experience. And uh, this happened a few years ago, but I repeat this story often to give people a perspective of how we're, we're seeing it. Um, the bus pulls in, I'm standing in the parking lot in the Abraham Avinu uh, neighborhood where we live, which is a small little uh, Jewish neighborhood of the old Jewish, it's been this documented history of the Jewish presence there for hundreds and hundreds of years, and there's a lot to be said, you'll have to come on site to hear. And the bus pulls in, and the inside of the neighborhood looks uh, nice, it looks like the old city in Yerushalayim, but the outside, there's yet to be a lot, a lot of work that needs to be done due to political uh, situations and restrictions and another topic we're not going to get into right now the outskirts look quite uh, ugly uh, the roads are not paved and the storefronts there are abandoned and whoever was there knows what i'm talking about in any event as this group is walking down uh, getting off the bus the um, we have the pleasure of five times a day to enjoy the sounds of, in, in a radius of maybe one square mile, uh, probably 10 to 15 mosques that um, you know, call for prayer at the same time. Allah Akbar and different, uh, it takes time to get uh, used to not hearing it, not noticing it. But in any event, this, the group is getting off, and this is their welcome. They hear this, uh, the mosques, and they're uh, getting off into the, uh, uh, this ugly uh, area outside of the neighborhood. And as I'm about to talk, this man says it was a group from California with the Chabad rabbi, 50 people. This man tells me, um, uh, you know, I say everybody, welcome to Hebron. He says, Rabbi, can I say something without offending you? That's that you can try. <laughs> and he said, you know, like, nervously, I, I walk around with a pistol. And I was like, anyway, but. Um, he says, uh, you know, Rabbi, me and my wife, we retired a few years ago, and what we do is, uh, now what we do is uh, we work very hard on our wives, and we, we travel, we tour, and wherever we go, we're, you know, we keep Shabbat, we keep kosher, and we follow the Chabad trail. So wherever we go, we make sure there's a Chabad. He says, Rabbi, we were in beautiful places, and exotic places. We were in Chabad in Venice, and Chabad in Aspen, and Chabad in Mexico, and he goes up a whole list of Chabad. It's beautiful places, exotic places. He looks around. He says, Rabbi, 
you must have done something real wrong that they sent you. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell him, and I tell really uh, the message is to anybody that uh, we meet that Hebron is definitely for us not a uh, punishment. It's a great reward. It has challenges, some challenges that none of my uh, fellow uh, shluchim uh, share with me. Some things that are much easier than other shluchim that are in other places. And uh, it's got to kind of uh, balanced out. But one thing that's really the reason that we're there, besides the rich history that the Chabad movement has from the days of its founding, all the Chabad rebbe's. Uh, um, had a special connection to the city of Hebron, sent uh, money there, sent people there. Many of the Jewish properties today are in our hands. These are Chabad uh, properties from the 1800s. So besides that, I mean, our main uh, Chabad work is with the uh, soldiers. Every, um, every four or five months, Hebron is a place that uh, military and civilian life are the most intertwined. As much as it is everywhere in Israel, it's not a uncommon scene to walk down Ben Yehuda Street or in Tel Aviv and see soldiers and see armed uh, men, something they don't see in the streets of uh, uh, New York too often or anywhere else. And I want to share with you something uh, personal. We, we uh, moved to uh, Hebron 13 years ago, in the summer of 2002. And uh, it was after a long, it was uh, in Hebron in 2001, there was a whole year of shooting attacks and terror attacks. When well, everything was going around in uh, all over Israel. So Hebron was a place that suffered a lot from these attacks. And we came in the summer, things were quieting down. And in December, December of 2002, I really, I remember it uh, literally, besides being a, you know, the Chabad, the Shaliyah, there's an awesome part. I was then much more active, but still a member of the uh, first response team. Uh, the IDF created in all the uh, in, in communities and settlements that are in areas of conflict, although there is a massive uh, uh, military presence where we are, but sometimes you know, these terror attacks and incidents are over in uh, 90 seconds, or, you know, a matter of a few minutes. So they train uh, groups of men that served in uh, combat units that still have the uh, drive to be a part of uh, kinds of uh, teams. And I remember it clearly, a Shabbos by Yetze. Uh, actually, next week is the uh, work site of the memory. There was a terrible, terrible uh, attack um, in Hebron. There's a, uh, a road that leads from Kiryat Arba, the newer part of the city, to the old city of Hebron. It's a, uh, maybe a seven, eight minute walk. Uh, most of the people that come to Marat HaMachpelah on Friday night, they're coming from Kiryat Arba, hundreds of people. Um, as people were walking back after the uh, prayers, and we were already sitting down at our Shabbos table and talking and you know, singing songs, the, even though it's a little far away, I remember how the meal was interrupted with uh, massive gun gunshots and explosions and um, the children, my children, that were much younger than uh, witnessed for the first time their father jumping up in the middle of the meal. The soldiers are running one way and uh, putting on a gun and a vest and a radio and just, unfortunately, we, we discovered quite uh, quickly the uh, tra tragedy that occurred, a, a terrorist opened fire on, a, beginning with civilians, then uh, as the, uh, military came to the scene, the IDF, the border police, and also a civilian first response team from Kiryat Arba. Um, exchange of gunfire, it's really an incident that ended up with a tragic uh, uh, result of 12 soldiers and civilians amongst them. Uh, the uh, brigadier, the uh, general of the whole uh, Judean uh, region, Dror Weinberg, and you know this was uh, something obviously a uh, experience that uh, doesn't doesn't leave and every time you go through that area and you see the place and like you know unfortunately I've been growing up in these areas uh, since I'm six years old and when these incidents happen people rush to help and there's different activities that are done 
And I remember, I'm a young uh, Chabad Shaliyah, and I remember um, the staff coming from this program, the Chabad, the uh, Victors of Terror program, and visiting and assisting with financial aid to the different uh, families. And I you know, thought it was very nice that uh, there's such a program exists. The years go by, and you know, I'm following uh, the work that's being done by Rabbi Kutner and the staff, and just now, you know, to hear, we're talking about having a continuous relationship, not something that's just on site. Twelve years later, the family of uh, one of the families of these uh, victims are not only visited on that day or during the shiva, but a, a, a connection that continues over the years. If it's financial support, if it's psychological support, if it's literally items that are needed. Twelve years later, Rabbi Kutler just told me the other day how one of the families of a soldier that was killed there, Gadi Rachamim, a border police soldier from Kiryat Malachi, uh, they, they're taking care of the bar mitzvah of one of the brothers. Okay, Shalom. I'm very excited to stand here today and to share with you my special shlichus of the Rebbe in Israel. After the Six Day War, under the direction of the our dear Rebbe, a special organization was out on behalf of the IDF widows and orphans under the Tzir Chabad of Israel. Twelve years ago, during the Second Intifada, I was called by Rabbi Yosef Arnold, the chairman of Chabad in Israel, to take on this mission of Chabad Terror Victims Project. Today, this organization helps more than 3,000 families. This book has the details of each family. Each line is another family, and each family is entire world. This past summer, when Operation Tsuketan began, we opened a war room at the headquarters of Chabad Israel. We immediately began helping everywhere across Israel via our shluchim who are located in every city. During this first stage of the war, our operation focused on both military and civilian areas. We visit every day the thousands of soldiers waiting on the front lines before the ground operation into Gaza. In the quicksand, and the map, we climbed on the tanks with the soldiers, uplifting the spirit and bringing them support while putting on feeling and giving out Chita's books and thousands of gift boxes with deodorants, sweets, and ice cream and pizza. After the other team, were sent to shelters to comfort thousands of frightened children and parents while in background the explosions of rockets and iron dome missiles can be heard. Together with the Shluchim in the south, we brought him a daily message of hope and faith, and boxes of books, toys, and candy. In the second part of the war, the IDF went into Gaza. We increased our activities to two more areas, visiting the hospitals and the homes of the soldiers who were daily who were sadly killed in the war. We visit 
all the wounded soldiers in the Soroka Medical Center in Be'er Sheva, in the Barzillai Hospital in Ashkelon, together with Rabbi Lieberman, who's sitting here with us, at the Adasa and Shari Tzedek Hospitals in Jerusalem, and at the Tel Hashomer and Bellinson Hospitals in the center. We cheer up the soldiers who were wounded with joy and gift, including luxury items like iPads, so they can continue to be touched with friends and expensive headphones so they can pass the long night in bed. When we met wounded soldiers who told us that feeling were burned in Gaza, we were happy to give them a gift of a new feeling. Together with the local shluchim, we visit the families of the soldiers killed in the war from Eilat in the south to Naharia in the north. Unfortunately, this visit had it another 170 wounded soldiers and 72 bereaved family to this book. We were joined in this visit by Shluchim from around the world who came to Israel for a solidarity visit with their Barabati. On this occasion, I want to say thank you very much to the Shluchim. Your support to our organization has given us Koyach to continue in our mission. I would like to mention specifically Rabbi Moshe Koplarski, Rabbi Eliezri from California, Rabbi Shemto from Uruguay, Rabbi Kaplan from Toronto, Rabbi Lipska from Miami, Rabbi Semini, Zayens and Lisbon from Los Angeles, Rabbi Gorari from New York, Rabbi Popak from the Hamptons, Rabbi Schmerling from Florida, Rabbi Amar from Paris, Rabbi Perman from Chile, and many other shluchim. In closing, I want to share with you a story of just one visit. We arrived at the Mendelovich family, a small town in the north called Atzmon. Their son, Oz, who was 21, was killed in Gaza. We met with, with Osnat, a single mother with two children. She told us that their young son, Rohi, was going to celebrate his bar mitzvah in a month and a half. They already reserved the hall and the catering and a fancy DJ, but because of the great sadness, she canceled the bar mitzvah. I told the man that I think that her son should not get punished twice. One, when his brother was killed in Gaza, and the second time, he will remember all his life that he did not have a bar mitzvah. I suggest that we will all organize a bar mitzvah at the Kotel in a more modern way, but with a lot of true Jewish simcha. The mother immediately agreed, and two weeks ago, Rohi had a very beautiful bar mitzvah full of joy and happiness. The day after the bar mitzvah, I get this email from the mother. Rabbi Menachem, Shalom. Every morning, when I open my eyes, 
I immediately get the slap in my face of my new reality. Oz is not here. And every morning, sadness and pain takes over my day. A part of yesterday. Thanks to the celebration, your organization, in honor of Ruiz Bar Mitzvah. It's been three months since the fall of Oz, and it's the first time I went to bed happy and proud. Proud that I'm part of Am Israel, and happy that my children were smiling the whole day, thanks to you. A huge thank you to Chabad Star Victims Project. You created a bit of pink in the black forest in which we live. Yeshar Koach Osnat Mendelovich. Thank you very much. So I myself also received already a week, a week or two ago uh, you know, quite in advance. We usually plan things by us a day or two before. But uh, from, <clears throat> from Rabbi Menachem, a uh, email, again, like in, before every holiday, a list of the families in our area that were hurt from uh, terror attacks, people that are, they're in touch with throughout the year, uh, making sure, giving instructions, what's going to be done throughout the country and throughout the Chabad Shluchim around the country, visiting these families, lighting Hanukkah candles with them, events, reporting back to uh, headquarters exactly what was done, collecting more information, and something, like I said, a continuous, continuous uh, project. Uh, while uh, Rabbi Kutner and his staff were at really the, the hard and almost impossible uh, task during this war of, besides visiting soldiers, but visiting families of people that were killed, vis visiting wounded soldiers going from hospital to hospital, visiting shiva homes, visiting really places of uh, despair and, and a lot, a lot of pain. Um, me personally, I was having uh, more fun and uh, in, a more, uh, in a place that was more, I'd say, a positive energy and happiness uh, due to connections that were established throughout the years with commanders and people that served in Hebron. So we got calls from Hebra, from units that were really, really inside and close to the borders and able to come and approach and sometimes in a legal way, sometimes not so, we won't say anything. But um, to visit these guys that are really, really on the front lines is not a cliche, uh, that you can't really get too much more front than that. And I noticed something visiting these places that, you know, from all over the world and all over the country especially was something really, really unbelievable to see that in every supermarket in Israel, in every corner, they're collecting items to send to the soldiers and sending through every Chabad to, to us really hundreds of pounds of, of packages of uh, toiletries and towels and underwear and undershirts and uh, goodies and we've come to these bases you know, with more stuff, and they'd be greeting us with boxes. Listen, there's really, there's no room here. Why don't, maybe you could give it out somewhere, maybe you could, and they really saw that they were overflowed. I'm trying to think what, what could they really, you know, what, what, all of these guys that are, that are at any given moment going into the battlefield, coming back to reorganize and regroup and going back again, and casualties, and what, what could, uh, what, what would they really appreciate? I noticed that amongst all those boxes of goodies and, uh, and uh, packages that were sent, um, a boxes of the food that they're being served, that the army is providing them. So these uh, packages of airplane, really airplane style, the way it's served, and also the quality, airplane food. And uh, this might be a good idea. We contacted a, um, a local a uh, merchant, a shawarma provider in, uh, in Sderot and you know, made a deal with him, giving him the uh, karnasa. And for, for a week, uh, that went almost every day, I can't, uh, I can't describe to you coming to an area that's 
it's all an area that the army just organized to for the troops before they go into uh, to attack to defend uh, tanks and jeeps and in the middle of the sand and dirt thousands of guys that are scattered around in a huge area and the rumor went out that there's a van here that's giving out shawarma was like a you know literally swooping down in uh, moments and just just to get the appreciation from these guys that really really appreciate something you know something that they they weren't getting at the moment um all these activities that you heard about and all the the eyes of uh, the jewish world were focused to the southern part of israel where the one of the largest cities in israel ashkelon uh, also happens to be one of the poorest cities in israel a diverse uh, community of uh, immigrants of traditional Israelis, a Sephardic uh, background, many uh, different different types of life, different types of communities. Nobody ever imagined, actually the Rebbe did when he warned about certain uh, precautions that the government might take, but that's not the topic today. But nobody really uh, imagined that Ashkelon would be a city that uh, would be in the headlines and be attacked by thousands of missiles and you know it's not talking about some settlement on some hill in some uh, place in an area this is uh, one of the largest cities in Israel uh, Ashkelon is also the home for many Chabad houses that are in every neighborhood a lot of Shluchim the largest Chabad educational institutes in the country with close to 2,000 students from the age of nursery till after high school where they're provided as a special Chabad high school they're providing not only yeshiva knowledge, but secular and technology, te technology and preparing them for their lives and really having a continued connection to these students way after they uh, leave the schools. I'm humbled and honored to introduce Rabbi Menachem Lieberman, one of the prominent and first uh, shluchim of the Rebbe to the land of uh, Israel, the head of Chabad of Ashkelon, to uh, please address us. to do all of this wonderful work that Rabbi Kutner does, that Rabbi Kohn does, that we do in Ashkelon, and basically Chabaz does in all of Israel. Because let me tell you a very small story, but a very sad story. I have a brother who's a rabbi in England, a very fine shul, a very good shul, a very uh, Zionistic shul, a shul that really believes in Israel. And it was during the war, it was during these very difficult times that we had 20, 25 seconds to be able to hit a, uh, to get into a safe shelter. And I gave him a call, he said, you know, the situation is very bad. We need a lot of help right now. Maybe you can help us. Well, he called this board together and they had a very meeting and they decided they're gonna help us. They're gonna say to heal him every day after that. And heal him is very important. They don't minimize the importance of heal him. But we have to know when to say till him and when to talk to talk and walk to walk. And you, my friends, that are here right now, together with your shluchim, you to support the communities that you live in. Don't only say till it, but you talk to talk and you walk to walk. And on that, I want to say all to each and every one of you, thank you very, very much. And if I may, you know, I'm a rabbi, right? So I have to start with the Vartera, you know how it goes, and that's how it is. And um, this week's Parsha, Parsha Hagetsu, we hear how Yaakov, starts on his very, very unique journey, not only his own personal journey, but that's actually by Yitzhi Yaakov, the wandering Jew. That's the journey of each and every one of us that we have to leave our homes and to be able to get out and to be able to accomplish something. And what's the first thing that Yaakov does? He goes to sleep and he has a dream. And if we take a look at next week's parasha, we see also Yosef at Sadi. One of the first things that the Torah tells us about Yosef at Sadi What's he doing? He's also dreaming. What is this with our forefathers that they're always sleeping around dreaming? What does the Torah want to tell us? No, but there's a very important message for us. We at the beginning of our world, where we want to go, the first and most important thing is that we should have a dream. 
a vision, an aspiration, something that we want to accomplish, something that we want to change. Yaakov dreamt like they, there's two worlds. There's Sula Mutzavarts and there's the ladder, which is in, deeply entrenched in this physical and mundane world. But there's also Reshemagia Shemaim at the top of the ladder, which the highest of all that. Yaakov saw, what did he dream, what did he fantasize, what did he wish to accomplish, that there should be an interaction, that it shouldn't be two worlds, a physical world and a spiritual world, but it should be Malachi Elohim, that there should be angels of a God that constantly combine these two different entities, constantly tie together these two situations, these two places. And that, my friends, is a nutshell of what we've seen here, what Chabad is all about. You know, they tell the story about this poor man, he was collecting and somebody goes ahead and gives him a substantial donation, at two dollars. Well, at one dollar he goes ahead and he buys a sandwich, and the other dollar he buys a flower. And somebody comes over and says, you know, you're hungry, you can barely live, why? What did you do? So he said, you know, with one dollar I bought a sandwich because I have to live. The other dollar I bought the flower that I have what to live for. Chabad gives the people not only sandwiches, but we give flowers. We give the people what to eat, but we also give them what to eat for. So um, very briefly, we'll show you in a nutshell what we did during the time of the war. I think it was the uh, title of my presentation today. Exactly what we did. All right, this picture isn't quite as difficult as to find the Waldo, to find your local rabbi in the big uh, uh, picture of all the Chabad rabbis. Let's go back. Now here I'm, uh, right, it's not very difficult to pick us out. And pretty soon we'll understand what lies behind this picture. What's the secret of this picture that was taken in a, our Chabad center, one of our Chabad centers that we have in Ashburn. Okay. And as we heard from Rav Kutner, that in the beginning of the war, we had all of the soldiers who were local, were stationed, a great deal of them were stationed just around the Ashkelon. Ashkelon, if anybody of you decide to come to visit us, where, anybody know where Ashkelon is located? Ashkelon is located on the border of Iran. It's not that we went to Iran, we just brought Iran to us. Because we went to us. <laughs> In any case, so we're just uh, five minutes north of the uh, city of Aza. <coughs> and it's Iran, for all practical purposes, that they have one mission in life. And that is to do what? Kill Jews. To kill Jews. That's what it's about, my friends. To get rid of the state of Israel. To drive us into the sea. And they're trying. They're trying. So if we heard from Rafkutur about the different places where the soldiers were stationed around the city, of, uh, around the uh, Gaza Strip. This is what the soldiers looked like. When I went and visited this particular, this is what the soldiers lived like. Now, it wasn't very easy, and unfortunately, if I can share, share with you some inside um, information, when we went to visit them in these outposts that they were that they found themselves, although, uh, when they, that they found themselves, um, they didn't have very, very clear instructions because they didn't really know what to do. And once when we were over there doing what we were doing, what pretty soon will say, um, uh, putting out film and doing different types of activities, all of them, that's our gun, uh, all of them, and all of a sudden there was an air raid siren. An air raid siren, what was the most obvious thing, thing, obvious thing to do? To take cover. The question is, where do you take cover? So all of us, myself, or our fellas, and Udi Ben David, we'll still talk about him, uh, Udi Ben David, we died for a personnel carrier, right? We have plenty of personnel carriers, they should be safe. And then somebody tells us, you're crazy, you're going into a personnel carrier? Because if there's a direct hit, what will happen? The whole thing is full of ammunition, the whole thing is full of explosives. It's better if you stay out of the personnel carrier. So what happened was, people out of the personnel carrier were running into the personnel carrier, people in the personnel carrier were running out of the personnel carrier, and that's how the war was fought. And we have the secret weapon. And what's the secret weapon called? Hashem is on our side, my friends. And that's what we saw constantly. Miracle after miracle after miracle. In the front lines, 
or also peah in Ashma. Okay. Now this gentleman with the Jinji over there, with the red hair, his name is Udi Ben Devi. He is a Chabad person, right? Right. He's striving to be. But he's also, this is some, um, he is also from the army. And, uh, after he finished the army, he made his travels throughout the world. And he ended up in California. And there he went to uh, met a rabbi called Rabbi Litzker. And he had an influence on him. And then he came back to Ashkelon. Came back to Ashkelon, but he lived in California and by Rabbi Litzker and by um, Rabbi Weiss in their Chabad house, which is found in which, uh, Anybody know the name of their Chabad house? Sherman Oaks. Sherman Oaks, that's right. And Sherman Oaks, he was there for a couple of few, a couple of months, came back to Ashkelon and decided to become a full-fledged Chabad. But he still works as a radio correspondent. It is, that's his job. And they wanted to see what Chabad was doing in order to be able to be report there. Okay. So as you see, one of the things that we did, like we told you, we heard we, before we heard about giving out the sandwiches, we gave out senses. This is Rabbi Gutman, he's the Chabad rabbi from Chadera, and we happened to meet him there near the tanks. And he obviously is being the rabbi of the IDF, so he helped us give out the tzitzes to the tanks. Now that they are here on each one of these um, tanks, if you take a good look at them, you'll see what they have is called Mi'il Haruach. You know what Mi'il Haruach is? Mi'il Haruach, I think in English it's called the Trophy Defensive System. In Hebrew, it's called Mi'il Haruach. What it is, it's an active defensive system to make sure that the intelligent rockets that are shot at the tank do not destroy, do not hurt the train. They can see the tank over there, but they get the electronic um, positioning, the train is found over there, and it's able to protect the tank. We gave out the tzitzis, and we told each soldier, this is your own private Mir'il Haruah. This is your own private spiritual cloak that you have. These are very special senses. You see the regulation colors and they're what the soldiers need. But even more than that, all the soldiers were happy to get them. Why? Because these are high quality senses. What does it mean high quality senses? They're made out of sweat deterring undershirts. You know these new undershirts, they have these material. And after they sit for an hour in the tank, they're all schmitzed and smelling and dirty. And so they're all happy, religious, non-religious. Everybody wanted these tzitzes because what they were, were wonderful undershirts. And they also have this added, this added, added, uh, uh, this uh, additional um, value that it was a pair of tzitzes. You know, if it doesn't hurt, you know, it might help. And so everybody was happy to get the tzitzes. Until we came to one thing. We came to one tank, it wasn't really a tank, but the side of the tank was up, and there were a whole bunch of, uh, yeah, a whole bunch of falafels, a whole bunch of, of uh, officers sitting over there. And I go ahead and I tell them, you know, this is your own mi'il ruach, this is your own protection. They tell me, boy, this guy is the one who invented the mi'il ruach. He's the inventor. I shouldn't take his name for I shouldn't take his uh, his, uh, his his trademark name from the for his protection system for us. So I thought, I'm sorry. Our senses are working already for thousands of years. We have seniority rights. We came first, and you're taking it from us. And here you go ahead and you see the different soldiers, the entire spectrum of the Israeli community. Everybody was happy and really asked for the census. Okay, and as you see, the soldiers are having a tough time. Well, okay, no need for that. In addition, here you see, giving out the tzitzes to the different soldiers, different situations that they find themselves. And it's only, it's not only myself, the pictures are a little bit uh, of myself, but we had everybody over there in all situations and to came together with our group of uh, soldiers giving out. But in addition, to giving out tzitzes and giving out food, we also put on film with the soldiers. And we were putting on film with the soldiers, and many, many soldiers, even though they didn't put on film regularly, they agreed to put on film with us until we came to, is that the next one? Is that one more? Until we came to Chaim. This is Chaim. 
The high officer of Sar, he's the highest ranking non-commissioned officer that there was in the area. And his job, like this, he had 67 soldiers that were found in Aza. And his job was to travel from out of Aza back and forth two, three times a day with the supply room, bringing them food, bringing them ammunition, bringing them everything that they needed. He had like 30 soldiers, 27 soldiers that were commandeering these tanks going back and forth and making sure that the supply routes to his soldiers that are found in the city of Aza where the uh, fighting was taking place, well, they also had their share of fighting and to make sure that they had their supplies. What do you think of that? Okay, this is Chayim. And Chayim, we tried to get him to put on film. We tried to get him to put on film. But he says, I haven't put on film since my mitzvah. I don't put on film. Okay. I don't put on film. I haven't put on film already for years. In any case, Udi tried to convince him. He says, Chayim. He was happy to take the tzitzes. The tzitzes, he was happy. Sure, give me tzitzes for my soldiers. I'll bring them over there in the front line in Gaza. You'll be happy with the tzitzes. Give me the tzitzes. So we gave him a bunch of tzitzes for the soldiers. But Phil, he didn't want to put that Phil. Udi, coming from where he came from, and he's a very sweet guy, spoke them and spoke them and spoke them, till finally, Heinz says, okay. I agree to put on film. I'm on condition. He wants me to talk the talk. He wants me to walk the walk. If we buy leather money for all of his soldiers, then you'll agree to put on film. What? What are leather money? All right, let's see so. We'll find a see so. This is Chaim, right? The, the film, the tzitzes, folding them up, taking care of his soldiers. So finally, Udi went ahead and he checked what I got. Udi went ahead and looked up a leather man. You know, the leather man cost like hundred dollars in Israel each. And he said, look at it. What's a leather multi-tool? Right, what is that? Yeah, a leather man, so we'll see one, is a multi-tool. In Israel it costs a rack a hundred dollars. But he says for his soldiers, it's a question of life and death. It's what is it's a plier and a pocket knife and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a saw and it has uh, 20 different functions. Like a Swiss Army knife, but uh, it's advanced a little bit since the Second World War. And uh, I think in America it's part of the regulation equipment. In Israel, it's not yet. And um, till till we went ahead and right away we went online. We said, okay, we can get you know a real letterman. It cost us about a hundred dollars. So he goes, I didn't think for like for 50 shekel, at fifteen dollars we can get one made in China. The leather bands are made over here. So I said, okay, he'll put on film even for the ones made in China. So here we have time putting on film. Okay. He's, he's all smiles, he isn't used to putting on film. Ah, here we have a picture of a leather man. And what happened was, or Hashem, or you still see, we advertised a little bit that we need help to get leather months. So there was Chabad of Mammoth County. There was Rabbi Hassana, and he came up, he came up and he says, my friends, I'll match you 50-50. And so we had him, he bought them straight from the manufacturer. We had him engraved Mi Chabad Ba'ava from Chabad to with much love. And we went ahead and we bought like 150 leather money to give to him, to the soldiers, to his backup crew, and to be able to give to them a platoon of soldiers. While we were visiting the soldiers in front line, Ashkelon wasn't quiet. This is a picture from my daughter's home in Ashkelon. As you can see right away across the street, the entire home, the roof was uh, devastated, destroyed. My daughter's home, only one window in the uh, entire home remained whole. Her children, till today, are traumatized as a result of the fact that when they were, this is what took place right across the street. Thank God there were no casualties, but they were all the traumatized I came to visit uh, with my father. He happened to be then in Ashkelon, and, um, uh, and and here you can see how just the house was just completely uh, turned over, and it's not only our house. It was all of the homes that were around this particular area, and all of them houses. Uh, during the war, we went and visited 
the elderly. Um, this lady had like 20, 25 seconds from when she had the air raid siren. Let me tell you, we were in the middle of Dublin when that, uh, when that bomb fell off, uh, fell near my daughter's house. I wasn't able to make it from the Vima where we were dabbling till the same area on the back of the shul. And if it would have owned my, my car, still today he has uh, pop marks from shrapnel that fell as a result of this bomb that fell. Well, that's one aspect. Another aspect, we gave over a thousand meals a day to people who were housebound, people who were homebound. This is Rabbi Pellis uh, organizing the meals and to make sure that there's nobody should remain hungry in the city of Ashkelon. If you want to make sure that the country is strong, you have to make sure that the civilians are strong. And if the civilians are strong, then the soldiers are strong. And if the soldiers are strong, then we have also, obviously, also the uh, army and the government is strong. We have different activities for the children. We didn't have what to do. They didn't have where to go. We gave them food as well. We had different programs in order to keep them, to keep them busy. Ashkelon, as we heard from Rabbi Kutner, he has also a hospital. We visited soldiers, and the little box is a leather man. You should see the excitement of the soldiers, even though they're wounded. Ashkelon, only the people who were slightly wounded were home, but were, 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 were uh, treated. But nevertheless, every soldier got a leather man, every soldier got a smile, and every soldier obviously got a good pair of senses. And here we have Rabbi Kutner coming to visit somebody very unique. Rabbi Kutner knows this family, knows this gentleman. Why does he know this gentleman? Because in the last round of hiding, this um, this soldier's older brother was wounded as well. And since his older brother was wounded, Rabbi Kutner met not only the older brother, but the entire family. Now we have an extra round of fighting, two years later, and his brother is wounded as well. And let's go, let's go quickly, we're, we're rushed. Okay, here we have Yareen Levy. This is one of our boys who learns in our school. He's one of the first people who were wounded uh, in the war. When he was walking to the barber shop, there was an air raid siren, he quickly ran, and a piece of shrapnel punctured him from the front, went through, punctured his lung, and lodged in the rib in his back. He was hospitalized, but he came to the hospital and the doctor thought that this is the end. This is finished. Today, Baruch Hashem is recuperating, and we have planned the Baruch Hashem for Hanukkah, and everybody's invited to come. We're going to make a big party, a big suit to say, no, for him, this is, we're visiting him, this is his wife, this is his family, it's Rabbi Kohn, Rabbi Grossman, part of our staff, coming to visit Yerin. This is Yerin's father in the back of the Okay, so after we got all of the letter money together, we made this wonderful party for them. And like Rabbi Kutner said, in the shawarma, we made it just a big splash of a barbecue for these soldiers, and they had a time of their life. And Chaim really pulled it fast. This is Chaim once again, taking a look. As you can see, he's all smiles, taking a look at the leather money that we supplied them with. Let's go over a little bit rushed. He's a son of leather money in my office, and these are the soldiers having a real time of their life. Each one of the soldiers a letterman, in addition to a letterman, a letter, in addition to letterman, some candies, and some sweets, and that's how this picture came about the thing. But we're in touch now with Chaim, and I don't with Chaim. What can I say? After we had this wonderful party, some of the soldiers came over and says, you know, Rabbi Lieberman, we never had any dealings with anybody religious. We never had any dealings. I guess these are fighters, these are kids from Cuba. See, these are kids that come from the real, real uh, in intelligence of Israel. They said they never had any context, never had any dealings with any religious people. And they said, wow, if this is what religious people are, then we're going to make sure we can pay a very unique relationship. Just want to tell you, my friends, the war is not over. We are still fighting this war. Where are we fighting this war? We are doing now post-traumatic uh, therapy with the children. This is Mickey and trying to find, this is our boys' school, and we have over, like you mentioned, 1,600 children, nine hour. This is our girls' school. This is a little sampling of the children that we have. The war continues till today. If the trauma that these children and the families and adults were affected by is not dealt with, it is something that remains within them. In Rome, 
and within 20, 20 years, when they'll get married, maybe the husband will say something, the wife will say something, all of a sudden, all of this, in, this, this inner bitterness, this inner trauma, this inner fear that there may be, all of a sudden comes out, and you see people reacting in ways that you don't expect. Baruch Hashem, we have a very, very established program together with the university, from bar Ilan, the head of the trauma department from bar Ilan, together with also Wingate. We're working together, and Baruch Hashem, we hope we're going to be able to make a change in the lives of the My friends, this could not be done without your help. So I want it without your help, giving us the tremendous help that you give us, the background support that you give to your local Chabad. So I want to tell you all, thank you very much. I'm Yisrael Chai. We're going to be strong and we're going to be, win even the final war that we need that will finally bring the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days. Amen.